time about tech threats from China. There's Beijing's artificial intelligence national plan. There's unregulated advances in biotechnology. There's large-scale espionage with Chinese-made telecommunications and subway cars. There are leapfrogs in hypersonics, in quantum, you name it. Across the board, it's the same story. China is out-innovating the United States and it's going to steal our lunch. Except the thing is that that's not true. And the truth is much worse. For decades, China has positioned in such a way that the rest of the world innovates, China obtains that innovation, and then it applies it. It applies it first and to scale. And it applies it so it can claim and co-opt global networks. Those networks are the foundations and the channels along which international resources flow, also that dictate that flow. If you can control them, you can control the world. This is a new form of state power unlike anything we have ever seen. It means that Beijing doesn't steal our lunch without innovating, without even trying to, effortlessly, and in fact, at a profit, China dictates what our lunch is and when, if ever, we get to eat it. Let's start with 5G. 5G refers broadly to the set of standards that are gonna define telecommunications over the next decade. That's what 4G does now and 3G did last decade. 4G gave us faster operating speeds so we could surf the internet on our phones, so we could have apps. 5G takes that one beat farther. It's lower latency and higher bandwidth promise a network that can host massive quantities of devices. So we can have a system of things talking to each other as well as people talking to people and people talking to things. And that's the internet of things. The technology underlying all of this is already well developed. The idea now is to turn it into a set of global rules to pick the patents and the systems that will become the standard for the fifth generation of telecommunications. And that's the 5G contest. Now, how is China fighting this? These standards are largely set by international bodies. There's 3GPP, which is an industry alliance, and there's the International Telecommunications Union, which is under the UN. Most of the world doesn't really talk about these. China does, a lot. It has national level working groups that are dedicated to preparing for 3GPP and ITU. It sends more representatives to their meetings than does any other player. And it makes sure that all of those Chinese representatives, no matter what their affiliation, are voting the party line. In 2016, the CEO of Lenovo made the mistake at a 3GPP meeting of voting for a US technology in one decision over a Chinese one. He later issued a very public and very profuse apology. And he has not been forgiven by Chinese netizens since. And this works. China's scale and its ability to marshal that scale with its centralization are such that at this point, 3GPP and ITU approve effectively nothing that Beijing opposes. At the same time, China also fights this battle on the ground. It subsidizes its state champions so that they can price their products well below the capabilities of any other global competitor, so they can claim global market dominance. Separate from the de jure standards that are evolving, China establishes a de facto monopoly over the infrastructure for global telecommunications. The US is starting to realize this. At least ostensibly, the White House has blacklisted Huawei, which is the primary state champion in the domain. But American concerns tend to be over direct security risks, over the idea of espionage coming from Chinese-made telecommunications. When Beijing talks about 5G, it talks about something much bigger. Beijing talks about building a ubiquitous information backbone for the internet of everything, or as they put it, the internet of things with Chinese characteristics. China sees a new world taking shape in which everything, physical and virtual, is connected over a foundational information backbone. Smartphones, TVs, cars, and energy grids dock into this. So do e-commerce and entertainment platforms, global logistics systems, payment systems, imagery, navigation, 
social media communication. Whoever controls the standard for this network controls the world. He gathers data on everything that is said, purchased, or moved. With enough data, he can predict as much. He can also shape those movements because he can adjust information flows to adjust incentives so that things move the way he wants them to. If a shipping company can't get information on a certain port, it's going to switch its route to a different one. If an article pops up first in my search results, that's the article I'm going to read. And if a Chinese-made car or metro system or payment platform is the one that's most compatible with the global information standard, that's the one that's going to sell. And in a fragmented world, nobody is going to say no to the dominant player that governs global exchange. Blacklisting Huawei doesn't change this. It maybe makes it a little more difficult for China to spy on the Pentagon, maybe. But it doesn't stop Huawei from exporting its telecommunications infrastructures globally. It doesn't stop Beijing from deciding what standards 3GPP and ITU approve. And it certainly doesn't stop China from doing the same thing in other information networks with other state-directed actors. Because this isn't just about 5G and Huawei. It's about every global standard, every emerging network, and every information system. It's about e-commerce It's with Alibaba. It's about FinTech with Alipay. It's about global navigation with Beidou. It's also about the fundamental information collection and aggregation for global logistics, for financial data, for industrial systems, for the human genome. This is precisely what the uproar in the US over big tech is about. We're worried because Facebook, Amazon, Google, and Netflix collect our data because they shape the information we receive and because they shape the markets that they in turn dominate. But while the US is fighting big tech at home, there is a bigger, badder tech building a global monopoly. And this one has an explicit authoritarian coercive agenda. It's not Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, it's the Chinese Communist Party. And the US is, believe it or not, uniquely ill-equipped to address this. First off, the US fails even to recognize the threat. Our system is built and programmed for a different form of state competition, for a kind of geopolitics that predates the information revolution. When we think about states projecting power, we think about militaries. When we think about countries clashing, we think about war. The US doesn't recognize the slow, deliberate, subversive, holistic maneuvering that defines the Chinese approach. The US doesn't recognize the idea that networks of exchange can be used as tools of state power. After all, globalization was supposed to spell the end of major power conflict. The rise of multinational corporations and information technology was supposed to mean the demise of the nation state. US geopolitical theory does not account for the idea that those global networks can be co-opted by a country, that it can use them to project its power, not to relinquish it, that cooperation can be weaponized. Even if the US does realize that, it's also ill-prepared to do anything about it. The network contest is one for opacity, for scale, and for centralization. Beijing has all of those in spades. American openness and fragmentation give China an angle in. They also stymie the kind of coordination and communication that's necessary for a strategic response. The US interagency government process is not seamless. And the US government is not on the same page as Wall Street or Silicon Valley. And that doesn't even mention the disconnects between the US and its allies. So that means that from Beijing's perspective, it's fail in Washington, try somewhere else in Washington, or New York, or Silicon Valley, or Canberra, or Ottawa, or Berlin, or London, or if you fail in London, try Hong Kong. That communication is the first thing that the US has to resolve if it's going to respond to China's threat. America will never be centralized, but the US private sector, government, and media can communicate. They have to. They have to realize that this is an existential threat. And all of them, everyone, 
is a tool and a target of China's offensive. So Washington bans Huawei, the US private sector gets on board. US tech companies stop handing China the technologies that it uses to subvert them. US investors stop giving China the resources that it uses to do that. And Washington creates the conditions in which all of this is possible in which the American private sector can afford to put its long-term interests, those of the country and those of the world, ahead of its short-term profit. Washington creates the conditions in which American telecommunications companies can build a strategic alternative to China's network and can do so with our allies so that it has the scale necessary to rival Beijing's. And across the board, everybody wakes up. Everybody acknowledges that for 40 years, China has been fighting a war against the US. And America, asleep and a-competitive, has been feeding China its lunch. We were told about 30 minutes ago to look for evidence that the future is better than we think it is. This is a case where it's important to look for evidence of what the present really is and how dire that could become. And then to make our own evidence that the future can be better. Thank you. <laughs>